it's crazy how much I guess food and marketing and the products are out there is all science like McDonald's has or you know KFC or all these like franchises have a lot of food scientists working for them who are actually figuring out what is the best ratio of fat to sugar to make it addictive and that's scary because they know how to I guess deter us from certain products and and increase our desire for certain products so it's no surprise that we're addicted to sugar because it's literally science. In 1837, Horace Mann created the education system, a system at the time designed to pump out factory workers and professors. The same system that is still being used today in the 21st century. Now, Mann's system is backfiring. We are being molded by the same industrial system that has existed for close to 200 years. That system delivers us into a digital economy that has no need of our outdated skills. This isn't our teacher's fault. This isn't the government's fault. This is due to a rapidly changing world full of technology and unforeseen circumstances. And us Gen Zs are caught in the middle. Welcome to the Driven Young Podcast, the podcast for stressed, overwhelmed young Australians, teaching you practical life skills you can implement now to set yourself up in life. And now your host, Byron Dempsey. Welcome back to the Driven Young Podcast. I believe there are three essential things we should be learning in school that every single student will use in their life. Number one is financial management and how to manage our money. Number two is understanding how to manage relationships. And number three is nutrition and what we should be putting into our bodies. Today's guest, we are diving deep into number three. I have brought on an incredible nutritionist to discuss health, food, and overall nutrition for young people like yourself. Alice Bleithman is an accredited practicing dietitian and nutritionist. Bloated belly, stressed and confused about what to eat, Alice has been there. Having been personally diagnosed with irritable bowel syndrome, Alice knows the struggles people face firsthand, which is why she is so passionate about helping people on their own health journey. Her approach is supportive, comprehensive and inclusive, the perfect mix of sugar and spice. And in this episode, we are discussing all things health and nutrition, specifically for Gen Z. We get into why health is so important, the benefits of a good diet, aside from just looking good. We talk about veganism, the goods and the bad, how 83% of people are dying from preventable causes, why we are so addicted to sugar. We give some practical tips so you can improve your own health now and so much more. As per usual, if you want to find out more about Alice, her links are in the bio. Don't forget to reach out to me on Instagram with any questions. And if you get any value out of the show, please consider leaving a review on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen. Now, over to Alice. Alice, welcome so much to the show. Thanks so much, Byron, for having me. I'm super excited to have a chat with you today about nutrition and diet and just overall health for younger people. But before we jump into all of that, I'd love to know a little bit more about your story um, who you are, what you did after high school and what you're currently up to. Yes, I'm super excited to be here. Thank you so much for inviting me over. Um, so essentially, I, well, I'm living in Sydney at the moment, um, but I never grew up in Sydney. So um, I actually grew up in Tassie, so Tasmania down the bottom of Australia. Oh, really? um, loved it there. I grew up in a family of five. Um, so us three kids and a dad and a mum. Um, my parents separated when I was very young though. So my dad lived in Melbourne for majority of my life, came visited us every second weekend. Um, and then it was just my sister, my mum, my brother and I. Um, we did all the adventure stuff you can think of. So surfing, swimming, snorkeling, scuba diving, nice, yeah. all that kind of stuff. Um, I feel very, very blessed to be living or to have grown up in Tassie. Um, it was something that I think every childhood should have um, an experience growing up outside. And I completely a, agree. Yeah, like I appreciate the outdoors so much more now. Oh man, because I was the same. We would like mountain bike all the time, yeah. and didn't do much surfing, but we did a lot of like yeah scuba scuba dive, well snorkeling and mountain biking and stuff, and it was the best. Yeah, yeah. So I'm um, after I like I kind of. Grew up in Tassie, um, did all the usual stuff, went to school, was never really a hugely academic person. I much preferred going to school, seeing my friends, leaving and then hanging out with my friends afterwards. Um, I was smart, I would say. I was a bright kid, but I never really utilised that until high school. Mm. Um, I was thankful um, that I actually got into a private school um, in year seven. So I went to a private school and it was quite strange. I remember we... Um, Back in my public school, in, in primary school, I didn't have to wear much school uniform. Like, I could wear my rugby shorts to school. And then I went to a high school that was like, you wear the bow your blazer, yeah, yeah. your skirt down to your ankles. And I was like, what is this? <laughs> 
Um, but it was, I cannot thank enough. Like I was supported throughout my entire high school degree, um, high school career. I thrived. Um, it was an all girls school. So there is competitive nature at that. Mm. Um, but yeah, I, I absolutely loved it. Loved all the kind of subjects like science and biology and sport and all that kind of stuff. And then I took a nutrition subject in year 11. Really? You did nutrition in year 11? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. That's what private school offers, isn't it? Yes. Yeah, so We didn't have that. No, and the public schools don't. So I, I'm very much blessed for that. Um, I was always interested in nutrition and why we eat. And I, I love food. So that was that was a plus. But in year 11, I took a nutrition degree, uh, nutrition subject. And I was like, this is me. Like, I'm obsessed with this. I love wow. learning all the fundamentals about nutrition, you know, macros and carbs, fats and proteins and, and antioxidants and all that kind of stuff. Um, so I left school and I was actually originally going to do medicine. And the reason why, in hindsight, I think I was going to do medicine was purely from the, I guess, um, my background, a lot of my you know, my parents and my and my um, my father and 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 um, aunties and uncles and everything like that. Grandma, grandpa are all kind of in that in that space. Mm. You know, doctors and, and nurses. Um, so I was like, all right, I'll do medicine because I've got the brains to do it. And from a private school, they kind of went, all right, medicine or law. Or like yeah, <laughs> yeah, law economics, or finance, engineering, or engineering. Yeah. So yeah. I was like, oh, well, I don't really want to do law because like I don't know anything about that. And you know, I like the human body and all that stuff. So I'll do medicine. But I decided to take a year off, uh, study completely after school because I was just like, mm, not 100%. Nice. That's so know. good you did that. So I'm so glad I did because yeah. I honestly learnt so much about myself during that year. I went to Europe for four months by myself, completely by myself, which I think was a really great decision. I was going to go with some of my friends, but I just decided, no, nah, I'm just going to go by myself. Like it's going to be a huge challenge and I'm, I'm a challenge junkie. I love it. Mm. Um, love doing stuff that kind of put me out of my comfort zone. So I went around Europe um, and that was incredible. Like I learned so much about myself and about people and about culture. And I came back and I was like, no, nah, <laughs> I don't want to do medicine. Yeah. Um, so thankfully, I actually applied for a degree in Melbourne. Um, so that was like a nutrition science degree. And I got a scholarship mm -hmm. for a university in Melbourne, Deakin University. And I was like, oh, this is fate. Like, <laughs> I have to go now. Like, I don't want to do medicine. I don't really want to stay in Tassie. I'd, I'd kind of explored the whole world. And now I'm like, mm, I don't want to go back to Tassie. Like, yeah, yeah. I have really kind of spread my wings kind of thing. So I moved to Melbourne to study nutrition and then masters in dietetics. And that's kind of where the story flourished and wow. then now I'm in Sydney working as a dietitian with uh, Marika Day and another fabulous dietitian we kind of are helping out with the start of of what we hope is a, a kind of a, a business that is doing nutrition a bit differently hmm. um, which is gut started so yeah that's basically Amazing. my story in a wow. nutshell it's it's funny because I didn't know your story but it lines so heavily with what I talk about on the podcast yep. like I, I'm so passionate about encouraging a gap year after high school. It's, unless you're so sure you know what you want to do, which most people aren't. But like for you, <laughs> it's like, and you're, you're a classic example of like at the pr private school, they're like, well, you're going to get a high mark, which means you have to go into law, finance, economics, engineering, law. Um, yeah, basically those yeah. are the core ones. Medicine. Medicine. Medicine, yeah. And it goes back to a concept where I kind of talk about, and it's like, just because you got a high mark doesn't mean you have to use that entire mark. Yeah. Because the other day my mum was saying, she had a friend who had a daughter who got an 89 ATAR, which is pretty good. Mm -hmm. And she did, she went into a pu public school teaching, uh, pr yeah, primary school teaching, yeah. which is like a 70 ATAR. And she was like, why would she do that? Why did she waste her ATAR? It's like, well, she just wants to study what she wants to study. It doesn't matter because she got the ATAR. And so that kind of links back to what you were saying about not doing medicine and actually following something you're a bit more passionate about. Yeah. And so now here you are today. Well, and to put it into concept, like I got a 99 ATAR and the wow. degree I did had a 62. Wow. Okay. So I was like the definition of wow. non, <laughs> I guess, linear. Um, and I, I didn't really care, to be honest. Like I honestly didn't care. And I think there was a lot of... Um, maybe somewhat judgment um not by my family but by other people like, well why don't you do use your brain like yeah, you've got yeah. the you've got the smarts like why don't you use it i am using it i'm using it in a way that i'm passionate about yeah. just because i'm not using it in what is kind of i guess um, Traditional. traditionally smart people do i don't even know what that means but 
unfortunately, yeah, that's what I was drilled into school. But well, here's the thing, right? I don't think a nutritionist has to be any, no, a lawyer has to be any smarter than a nutritionist. Yeah. It's just economic, it's based off economics. Like, there's more people wanting to do law, therefore the ATI requirement is way higher. There's less people wanting to do nutrition, therefore it's quite lower. It doesn't mean you have to be smarter to be a lawyer, or smarter to be a nutritionist. Mm-hmm. That's just based off economics. Correct. And as, as we've seen, there's a lot of people out there who aren't smart in nutrition and are putting out a lot of false information when they actually have no idea what they're talking about. Yeah. Um, which kind of links into that influencer thing we were talking about just before the episode. Um, so if we dive into nutrition, I guess before we get into the whole influencer and get into phones and social media and what we're seeing yeah. online, why is nutrition important from a young age? And why should like us as listeners and even myself listening to you, why should we take care of our bodies and like be f- putting the right nutrition into our bodies? A brilliant question. I think a lot of people don't really know necessarily the answer. They know, yeah, good nutrition is important, but like why like why is it important essentially like food is the fundamentals of ourselves like if we eat poorly we will have poor health and if we eat well we would generally be more likely to have good health Mm. now i'm not saying that food is fun like the most important thing ever there are so many other aspects of health that you need to kind of prioritize as well sleep stress exercise all that kind of stuff yeah But if we have good nutrition, we're kind of setting ourselves up for success Mm -hmm. in life. So it can be from, you know, having enough energy to having good bone health, to having good muscular strength. All that kind of stuff is so, so important. And we get that through largely food. If we don't have good nutrition from growing up, then our eating habits are generally poor as we are older and therefore we're more likely to suffer from chronic conditions that we know are linked to nutrition deficits and things like that. So diabetes, cardiovascular disease, some cancers even. Mm. So, Which is a... I yeah. think it's like 83% of Australians are dying from chronic diseases. Yeah. Like yeah. a huge amount of Australians. And they're largely preventable yeah. through nutrition. Obviously, not all diabetes is preventable. Mm-hmm. But like type 2. Type, and type 2, two. Yeah. 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 Type 2 di- diabetes is majority preventable through lifestyle, mm. one of which is food. Mm. Correct. Yeah. It's really, really scary um, that, and I only see this now, is that not many people really know how to eat well. And that's largely because during school, you don't really get taught that, which is strange enough. Yeah. Um, considering that food is like everyone eats and everyone needs good food and good nutrition to thrive. And we're not taught that in school, which I find quite weird. Yeah. Well, there's three things I think every single person who graduates school will encounter, but we don't learn. Food, nutrition, finance, how to manage money and relationships and how mm. to manage relationships. Yeah. It's like we don't learn anything about those three things. Unless you did your nutrition course specifically in high school, which I didn't even have the option to. Yeah. We had PDHPE, mm. which like softly touches on it. The Australian Guide to Healthy Eating and yeah, stuff. Yeah, yeah. And I guess Healthy Harold or something yeah. when you were a kid, which is great. <laughs> ah, Healthy Harold. <laughs> um, um, but we're talking more, I guess, also figuring out that there is no just one, here's how to eat healthy. Like everyone has different body types. Health is different to so many different people, which is why like nutrition is, you know, what, a four or five year degree or something. Yeah, five. Because it's not... You can't just go, here's how to eat healthy. Yeah. There are like, you know, vegetables are good and like those blanket statements. But if you just listen to one thing and don't actually think, does this apply to me and my body type and experiment, Mm -hmm. it can be quite dangerous, can't it? Correct. Correct. And there are like, that's why you've got, you know, the Australian Guide to Healthy Eating and Eat for Health guidelines and things. You've got the generic kind of stuff, you know, eat your veggies, eat more grains, whole Mm -hmm. grains, reduce alcohol, reduce smoking, eat, drink water, et cetera, et cetera. They're the general guidelines. But what happens if you've got, for example, diabetes or what happens if you've got polycystic ovarian syndrome or you've got like an eating disorder or iron deficiency or a pregnant Those guidelines don't really cover that stuff. And unfortunately, those kind of conditions are brandished across social media. For example, hormonal imbalances you're seeing a lot of. What does that even mean? Like, honestly, what does that mean? Mm. Hormonal imbalances can range from a person who has PCOS to just chronic stress. You can't necessarily change that through food. Mm. You can help it, but I think a lot of people are relying on food necessarily or fundamentally to improve those conditions. And that's kind of what we learn through a nutrition and dietetics degree is, yeah, okay, we know the fundamentals of good nutrition, but what happens if we've got a client who has cancer Mm. or bowel cancer, for example, where we need to make sure that they're having a low fiber diet or a high fiber diet, depending on what what, um, chemotherapy or what surgery they're having. All that kind of stuff we don't necessarily, I mean, obviously I'm did a five year degree, so like I learned that stuff, but 
I don't think people really understand that that's the stuff you learn and you need to know that stuff to offer sufficient, incredible advice, mm. not just, oh, yeah, I know this happened to me and I cured my this through this. Yeah, because it's like just because it worked for you doesn't mean it's going to work for everyone else. Yeah. And putting that out as a blanket. Statement. So if you say, hey, look, this worked for me, maybe it might be worth giving it a shot, but people will blindly trust people, especially mm. if they're like big influencers who have yeah. like a following base around their, their looks and their health and their body. Mm-hmm. They're very influential when it comes to putting out advice when it might not actually be that accurate. Yeah, and it's not like the influencers are doing it in a malicious way, yes. but I think there needs to be some sort of boundaries guidelines i don't know they have to have credentials or something like that to be offering nutrition advice and it's it's the same concept as i wouldn't ask you to do my surgery on my knee for you know an acl replacement or so why would i ask old mate down the road to help me with my diet Mm. and yes they can provide generic advice everyone can do that you know eat veggies and all that stuff but if you've got a condition like hormonal imbalances whatever that may be I don't think it's safe to go to influencers or other people who don't have credentials because that can actually be more detrimental than... Especially because they're not tailoring the information to you you and your body type and whatever condition you have. And let, I mean, if we, let's face it, this is a podcast for younger people. Everyone, young, young, not everyone, but there's such a large amount of conditions going on, um, mental health, mm-hmm. you know, depression, anxiety. Mm-hmm. There's so many stuff going on with younger people that you should be careful Mm -hmm. with who you're going to for advice, not just for health, but for anything in general. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And even that being said with the whole mental health thing, like I know there's a lot of stuff like eat, you know, you have to eat really well for your own mental health, which is there's a lot of science behind it. But, you know, if you've got someone who's ill health and, you know, depressed or something like that and they can't go out and and buy their own food and things like that, is that really realistic for them? Saying Mm. you have to be eating five fruits and vegetables and all that kind of stuff and, you know, reducing processed food when they can't even get it out of the house. And that's when, you know, a clinician is really, really important in that case because Mm. sometimes it just doesn't work and it's not realistic. Yeah. But also for younger people, I think we think we're very bulletproof when it comes to our metabolism and like, you know, I've, I've eaten crap my whole life and look, I'm in good shape. Yeah. Yeah. That's cause you're 18 or yeah. you're 15, you're 16, you're 17, you're 18, you're 20, but we know that's going to catch up to us. Mm-hmm. And I guess as a young person, this applies across everything, financial habits, health habits, nutrition habits. If you can start young and build those habits early, they'll transfer into your later life. And the, it can, the same be, can be reversed for your bad habits. Yep. So if you've got bad financial habits, bad nutritional habits from a young age, which could have been d- because your parents or whatever scenario, that's going to transfer over later life when your metabolism is a lot slower mm-hmm. and then you're going to start to mm-hmm. you know, see what happens when you don't eat as well. Yeah, and it's not just related to weight as well. Like, yeah, your metabolism does slow down as you get older. That's just the way it is. Mm. And you might have to eat less and you don't realise that you're eating that much. And then when you're 30 years old and had a kid and you're like, oh my gosh, I can't eat, you know, fries and burgers every day. But it also refers to all these other things. You know, if you're eating poorly through childhood and through adolescence, you're not getting, maybe not getting enough calcium, maybe not getting enough iron, Mm. you know, vitamin D, all that kind of stuff is really good for our bone health. It's really good for our organ health. B12 is really good for our brain health, all that kind of stuff, omega-3s and everything. Like That's really important as well, not just for the immediacy of that moment in time, but also as we age and things like that, mm. we're more likely to be predisposed to things, even like Alzheimer's disease and all that stuff. <laughs> Nutrition is really important in yeah. that case. And as I yeah. mentioned, like there's a, a lot of, you know, 83% of Australians are dying from chronic diseases, which can be largely preventable through your nutrition. And you can start early. So it's just always thinking long term. It's like if you have bad nutrition now, it's not going to affect you, but it's going to affect you in the long term. Yep. And you've got to start thinking long term when it comes to your nu- nutrition, um, as I'm sure you've probably seen with a lot of your clients and stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like, and I, I love the analogy, the analogy you use, the um, finance one. You mm. know, it's like superannuation. Like you've got to kind of build up that that um, that budget um, and make sure that you're kind of putting some things behind. Not that you need it now, but in you know, 20, 30, 40, 50 years, yeah, you'll 50 need years. it. And it's the same goes with nutrition. You know, If you're eating poorly in your 
tens, twenties, thirties, it's going to catch up with you. And if it doesn't, you are the lucky one percenter that mm. it doesn't. And that's the case. Sometimes it just doesn't. And nutrition doesn't, you know, even if you have poor nutrition your whole life, you might not get cancer and die of old age. And you'll hear people like, oh, he's been smoking since he was 10 years old and he's yeah. nine years old. It's like, well, he got lucky. Yeah, <laughs> he got very lucky. And as well, genetics do play a role. You mm. know, some people are more likely to get lung cancer than others, which is just the case. Mm. But you like why not why not try your hardest like why not do what you can to improve your longevity yeah and so what are the benefits we, we kind of briefly mentioned them but what are the benefits of having good nutrition so i guess for me who's hasn't done any research into it just based off how like when i've eaten well and exercised and i haven't like you just got way more energy it's probably the biggest one like i yeah. feel like you can think clearer you don't feel sluggish. Like you have that sluggish feeling after you've had yeah. like KFC or something. Yeah. Like I can't eat KFC anymore. It makes me feel crap. Yeah. I haven't eaten KFC in ages. Um, yeah. But like, I guess what are the core benefits of having good nutrition? So, I mean, there's this immediacy thing. So feeling vibrant and energetic, mm. that's really important. And then you've got like the long-term, I guess, um, or greater term things like your bone health, like I mentioned before, um, your ability to you know, your fertility, even even um, your brain health, both now and in the future, more likely to be, if you have poor nutrition, you're more likely to be um, at risk of Alzheimer's disease and mm. dementia. Um, your Even things like your hair health and your skin health, wow. your eye health, all that kind of stuff. If you think about it, food is fundamentally your, like your cells. Yeah. So if you have you made up of. poor nutrition, then you're more likely to have poor cells and poor organs and, and everything like that. Um, if you have good nutrition, it kind of also is important for your future generation as well. So like I mentioned with the fertility thing, there's a lot of upcoming research with what we call epigenetics. So essentially sometimes these genes get turned on or get turned off. If we have good nutrition throughout our whole entire life, it can actually help turn on these good kind of genes. And essentially those genes will then go onto your offspring mm. and then that offspring will have those good genes. Yeah. Those good genes could be like, you know, um, protected from cancer, for example. Mm. And is it the reverse if yeah. you're bad? Yeah. Bad nutrition so, health? Yes. So nutrition, smoking, alcohol, no exercise, stress, all that kind of stuff can kind of switch on or switch off kind of genes and they're more likely to kind of be of detriment to their offspring. Mm. So it's fun. it's just like so important. It's yeah. so important. Um, you could probably talk about this for another I could, hour. Uh, <laughs> I should have wanted a list. Like there's everything, everything, honestly. Every yeah. part of our health is determined by nutrition. So I would say if you want to be if you want to be high performance, yeah. if you want to, you know, be driven, driven young, if you want to, <laughs> yeah. you know, go be go, going for your goals and everything, you need to look at having a good nutrition, good exercise, good yeah. sleep. Yeah. Just having those kind of those core three things yeah. just so you know so you're functioning because yeah. there's people out there like athletes and mm -hmm. the top performing people in the world whether they're athletes or business or whatever it is if you look at them they usually have like really good nutrition they, I mean they can afford like a nutritionist they can afford a personal trainer and stuff mm -hmm. so how can someone like us who are in high school or we don't have much money how can we make sure and maybe let's say a scenario where your parents aren't that best at feeding you good food how can we try to break that habit mm. and try eating healthier mm. like Man, there were kids at school who got like 10 bucks a day to f eat at the canteen. Mm. I got yeah. five bucks on my birthday. Yeah, like, that was Same. <laughs> like, And I was, like, I was like, oh my God, I can get it. Yes, I can get pizzas. Yeah, I can get a pie. No yes. way. But there are people who are doing that every single day. Yeah. Which is, and like a Coke as well. Yeah. It's just mental. I think you made a really good point there, Byron, in that the family is really important for young people. So a lot of my clients, um, young clients especially, come in and they're like, you know, I don't even know how to eat well. What are carbs? What are fats? What are protein? What's fiber? Like, what even are, you know, what's spinach? All that mm. kind of stuff. And it's not their fault. Unfortunately, it's the parents' fault or whoever kind of looks after them. And that is unfortunately probably their grandparents' fault or parents' fault. So, and so on and so on. Yeah, so I think... It don't um, yeah I think to be honest to address a child's poor nutrition knowledge you probably need to address the family's yeah. poor nutrition knowledge but if they're wanting to improve their nutrition I think the first thing you need to do is ensure that you're having whole foods so not going to the canteen every day is probably a good start yeah, so yeah. making sure that you're having whole foods like 
vegetables and fruits and whole grains and nuts and seeds and sprinkling of um, omega-3s through like good fatty fish like salmon and mm. and some lean meats so meats without as much fat on them so things like um i don't know uh what is it i feel it kangaroo steaks all right. that kind of stuff so I think that's probably the best advice I would give is if you're in a situation where you can opt for whole foods, um, largely plant-based, because there is actually a lot of evidence to support a plant-based diet, a good plant-based diet. So not necessarily a vegan diet per se, but one which is largely plant-based. Mm -hmm. So plants being vegetables, fruits, nuts, seeds, legumes, etc. Yeah. And yeah, it's funny going on to like kind of veganism because I've kind of I've been aware of vegan. I know the health benefits and stuff. And there's yep. lots of documentaries and understanding that we're probably eating too much meat. Yeah. Like as a, just an entire society, we're eating way too much meat, you know, like breakfast, probably not. Some people do. But lunch and dinner, mm -hmm. everyone's having meat for lunch and dinner. Mm -hmm. And it's like, do, is it unhealthy for us? Mm -hmm. should, we, should we be trying to cut back on meat? Yeah, it's... So yes, so meat is a what we know. Some meats are like a carcinogenic, which is essentially um, cancer-causing substance. Yeah. Um, so yes, we need to be cutting down on meat, majority of the case. But what's also important is you're replacing that meat with plant-based products. Mm. So a lot of the research, yes, supports a plant-based diet or vegan diet, essentially. But we don't know whether it's supporting the fact that they're having more plants or whether the fact that they're not having as much meat, mm, right. which is really interesting. So if you go on a vegan diet and aren't eating meat, but you're eating all those, you know, Beyond Burgers or, you know, fake meats and Oreos, which are actually vegan, yeah. um, all those kind of processed vegan products, you're probably not better off doing that. Which is what so many vegans do, right? Yeah. I see so many vegans that are like, oh, I'm, I want to... I mean, there's, few, there's normally two reasons people go vegan, for the health reasons or because they don't believe in harming animals. Yeah. Um, and if you're doing it for the health reasons, you need to do it right. Yeah. Because so many people would, like, find, like, I'll, I'll go, I went out with some vegans and there was nothing on the menu, so they just got chips. Mm, yeah. I was like, how is this any healthier yeah. than what I'm eating? And, yeah, good point. Like, some people go vegan purely for ethical reasons and that doesn't mean that they have to eat healthy, whatever. That's fine. Like, they do you do you kind of thing yeah. but if you're wanting to go vegan purely for health benefits you need to make sure that it's actually you're replacing the meat with mm. something healthy so vegetables nut seeds grains legumes it's also important that if you are going to go vegan you probably should seek nutrition advice from a qualified nutritionist or a dietitian and the reason being is meat's really high in things like iron yeah. and protein and, and zinc and other vitamins and minerals. So a lot of the time you go vegan or, or plant-based and it's actually quite a lot more difficult to get those nutrients. It's not impossible by any means, but it is more difficult. So replacing those meats with things like legumes and, and beans mm. and things like that is is really important. Is tofu um, a good one? Tofu is a good source of protein, yeah, 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 and some other vitamins and minerals. So making sure that that vegan diet is actually conducive of a healthy diet, not just a vegan diet because it's supposed to be healthy. Yeah, yeah. So basically yeah. if you're going to go vegan, do your research and do it right. Correct. And probably, especially because... I don't know if you're saying this in your clients, yep. but so many young girls specifically, mm -hmm. every young girl I seem to meet is iron deficient. Yeah. Like it yeah. seems to be like a, a pandemic yeah. of iron deficiency going yeah. on right now. Yeah, correct. So iron, I was, I was going to mention this actually. If you're going to go vegan, make sure you get your bloods done before you transition. So and you can see the difference. Yeah, yeah. And the reason why is if you have low iron before you go vegan, you must supplement um, under the guidance of a healthcare professional, obviously. And what you also can't get from a vegan diet is a vitamin called vitamin B12, um, which is actually naturally found in soils and things like that. But unfortunately, because of the way the soil is these days, it's really, really, really hard slash impossible to get it through plant-based foods, except mm. sometimes through soybeans. So if you're going to go vegan, you actually are recommended to always forever supplement with B12. So that's really important as well. Yeah, okay, um, cool. And especially for females, making sure that you do have enough iron um, in your diet. So through things like beans and legumes especially, um, but also some like plants and like spinaches and, and leafy greens as well. Yeah, awesome. Because yeah. that, that's just a huge thing I'm seeing. Like, yeah. I swear everyone I meet, they're like, they, they joke about it. Yeah. We were mentioning before, it's very common to for our generation to joke about mental any problem you've got. Be like, yeah. oh, 
you know, there's like a joke whenever they stand up and they like the blood rushes or something because they're iron deficient, they go all dizzy. Oh my gosh. And so I've seen lots of those jokes on online. Really? Which is, which is fine. Yeah. But it just shows how, pre- you know, how prevalent it is of yeah. a problem it is. Yeah. And um, it's not good to be iron deficient. <laughs> of course, yeah, yeah. So I think anyone who is needs to supplement, but also don't just assume that you are. So you need to get blood tests yeah. for it. Yeah. Um, I would recommend if you are vegan and iron deficient, definitely hone in on the iron plant-based sources. Mm. But if you are non-vegan, so animal eating, um, and you are iron deficient, it's also important to see if there's any other kind of more sinister reasons as to why. So, for example, one of the signs of celiac disease, which is your inability to, I guess, or an autoimmune condition where you can't digest gluten, essentially, or you react to gluten, what happens when you have really, really bad celiac disease is that the small intestine actually can't absorb the iron. And so that's why you're iron deficient. You might eat all the meat in the world, but if you have celiac disease undiagnosed or, or not managed, then you're not going to be able to absorb that iron. Yeah. So it's really important to get that yeah. checked by a health professional. Yeah. Well, it's just crazy. Even this conversation, like obviously you're just scratching the surface in terms yeah. of, but like the amount of knowledge there is in nutrition that we are unaware of. And it links back to what you said earlier about how you know, you wouldn't get some random person to operate on your knee or you wouldn't get some random person to build a bridge or like basically pick any career pathway and you wouldn't get some random person to do it. Mm. But because we all eat food, correct? we all kind of think we're an expert. Yeah. Um, yeah. Same kind of goes with like business as well. Like people give business advice when they've yeah. never run a business before because yeah. it's easy. Mm-hmm. And, but it's just accepted. Mm-hmm. 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 Yeah. And yeah, exactly what you said. Like everyone eats, so therefore everyone knows, but not everyone should be kind of sharing that advice. And yeah. I get like at a party or something like that, if you're like, oh yeah, I, I tried eating more meat or tried eating less meat or tried eating vegan or whatever, and that worked for me. Yeah, yeah that's fine. That's okay. Like that's not necessarily going to affect many people. But if you're brandishing that through social media, especially, or through a lot of people through another platform, that's not safe. Mm. That can be really detrimental. Yeah. yeah. And because there's so many different things out there now. There's like paleo diet. There's like, there's so many different diets yeah. and all of them seem to work for some people. Yeah. And if we're talking about like improving your diet and like weight loss and stuff, the way I kind of see it, it's like all these diets seem to work if you just stick to it. Yeah. yeah. Most, most people just will try paleo. They won't see results for yeah. a, a few weeks or something or they'll try this diet and they won't see results. So they'll kind of give up. Or if you stick to any diet or any program, it's mm-hmm. probably going to work. If it's, yeah, if it's done well. If um, it's a good program, yeah. yeah. So, and basically, if you, a diet, a good diet is one that works for you. If it doesn't work for you, it's not a good diet for you. Mm. And if you're doing it for weight loss, for example, it needs to be a diet that puts you in a calorie deficit. Mm. And that's why diets work. It means that you're eating less than you're burning. And that can be through a ketogenic diet. That could be through a high carb diet. That mm. could be through paleo diet. That could be through veganism. That could be through intermittent fasting. The basis is all there. It's a calorie deficit. Yeah. So if it works for you, then do it if you want to. But if it doesn't, then try something else. Yeah. And there's nothing wrong with that experimenting. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And figuring I think it's important for people to experiment and figure out how their body reacts to things. Mm. Um, you know, I know a lot of people aren't actually gluten intolerant, but they feel sluggish and weird when they have yeah. milk or dairy yeah. and stuff. Yeah. And that's fine. It's just yeah. experimenting with your body to figure out what works for you. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And I also think making sure that you're experimenting um, in ways that are actually somewhat evidence-based. Mm. Yes. <laughs> so you're not just going, oh, I feel sick when I have gluten. I'm going to cut out all gluten from my life. Yeah, Therefore, yeah. I'm gluten intolerant because I feel better. Because there might be other reasons. Interestingly, actually, and I thought I'd touch on this quickly, is um, gluten intolerance largely, well, isn't a thing. Um, it's not a thing. It is either celiac disease, which I mentioned before, which is an autoimmune condition in which you don't react well to gluten. And then there's what we call um, fructan intolerance or malabsorption. So fructans are actually present in foods that contain gluten, like breads Mm. and what people are reacting to when they feel sluggish and gross is actually the fructans in the bread not the gluten in the bread so when they cut out gluten they're incidentally cutting out fructans which is actually what they're intolerant to wow so yeah when you hear someone saying gluten intolerance that you know gluten's a devil and gluten's inflammatory and everything it's yeah fundamentally (laughs) not the case yeah but it goes back to what i said about the um Iron deficiency. It's just a trend to like kind of yeah. bring up, make, make fun of people with gluten and stuff, which yeah. is fine. Yeah. Um, but if, I mean, if you feel better, you feel better, right? That's exactly right. If you feel better, if you feel, like you feel better, but it doesn't mean that Bob down the road is going to feel better on it. Exactly, which is the important thing. <laughs> yeah. 
And um, I kind of want to switch up here and talk about sugar. Yes. And I guess, you know, the entire world, especially the Western countries, Australia, America, UK, Canada, the, the, you know, New Zealand, those sort of countries are suffering from like a massive obesity crisis and a sugar crisis mm-hmm. due to processed food and everything that's going on. Mm-hmm. And um, I think, as I mentioned to you earlier, I don't really get addicted to many things. The two things I might argue I'm addicted to could be number one, my phone, and number two, sugar, mm-hmm. even though I don't think I eat much sugar. Mm. I don't have any sugar in my coffee. My mm-hmm. breakfast has no sugar. It's just the, the sugar and things that you don't even realize have sugar in it. Yeah, yeah. Even like things like br- everything has sugar in. So yeah. there's no re- like it's not your fault that you're addicted to sugar. It's not anyone's fault that they're addicted to sugar necessarily. Sugar is in literally everything. It's in sauces, mm. it's in breads, it's in pastas, it's in cheeses, all that kind of stuff. So yeah, I I would definitely agree that a lot of people are somewhat addicted to sugar. Yeah. Mm. When I did a immense retreat where we went into the bush for like 24 hours, no food. Wow. I, I, I had no craving craving for food really but it was like sugar mm, yeah you know this was like what i hadn't eaten for like 18 hours mm. or 20 hours or something it's like yeah. not that long and i think you need to remember as well that sugar in its purest form is glucose which is our body's preferred source of fuel so you probably were wanting sugar because you needed that quick fast mm, energy i was tired yeah but i think people relying on this quick fast fix nowadays because they're exhausted and they're stressed and they're also addicted to it Mm. so it tastes nice and it comes with you know burgers and fries and delicious stuff paired with fat which is our weakness fat Mm. and sugar combined together is like the best thing humans can taste Mm. um from a biological sense so yeah I think it's important to note that sugar isn't inherently bad. Sugar's in lots of really good fruits and vegetables. Like apple's and quite high in sugar, isn't it? Yeah, but it's also really high in fiber. Mm. So and, and vitamins and minerals. It's and natural like sugar, that. isn't it? Yeah, 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 yeah. Every sugar in the world is broken down in our bodies as glucose. So it doesn't necessarily matter in terms of, I, I guess, a, a metabolism point of view if you have sugar from fruit versus sugar from a candy bar mm. but what this fruit also contains is fiber which slows digestion and kind of reduces the impact it has on your blood glu- glucose level which is important for energy and people who have diabetes for example but it also contains things like vitamin a and vitamin c and all those beautiful vitamins that we need mm. but that candy bar what does that contain like sugar a lot of calories not much else some soul food maybe but yeah it's not you can't compare right. apples with candy bars because apples contain so much more than just sugar. Yeah, right. Yeah. No, that's a really interesting thought. Yeah. So, yeah. Because I thought natural sugar was better than other sugar, like processed sugar. Yeah. You're saying it's basically the same, but when it's natural sugar, it's with all the other benefits yeah. of fiber and everything. Yeah, yeah. It, all sugars get broken down into glucose in yeah. our bodies and used as fuel. But yeah, how you get that sugar is another another thing to think about. Which is why, you know, especially kids, when they have sugar, they go up, high energy because they've got that fuel going in yeah. and then they, the fuel leaves yeah. and they're like have sugar crashes almost yeah yeah, yeah. which is you know really not good <laughs> not good especially from a young age because we're conditioning ourselves to kind of get used to that feeling yes exactly right exactly right and even what you were talking about in terms of that feeling is yeah we get it from sugar like we get it from drugs and alcohol and coffee and all that kind of stuff we need that constant constant energy mm. and when we don't get that that's when we feel crappy and tired and everything like that so what's the best and easiest form of of energy sugar mm. so that's why we revert to it um but i think yeah it's it's quite interesting as well in terms of the taste bud perspective side of things when we reduce our sugar intake our taste buds actually get kind of um, used to that and over time our ability to detect sugar actually increases so our sensitivity yes. increases so for that. example if we have a really really high sugar diet and then we gradually reduce sugar when you have a candy bar that candy bar is going to taste a million times more sweet because our taste buds have literally adapted to lesser sweet foods so the kfc example i gave yeah, yeah. and I, in europe i went to europe mm. so did you as you mentioned yeah. the, the soft drinks were so sweet yeah i don't know what it was but i was like i think i'm done with soft drinks yeah. i don't need to drink soft drinks again yeah. yeah i didn't have any soft drinks on the cruise except when i was like at a bar or something mm. with alcohol yeah and then i came back to australia and I, I didn't i kept not having soft drinks and i had one one day and i was like oh it's actually really nice yeah so i don't know what it is yeah. just it was so much more sweet and yeah. in Vietnam, some of the drinks are so ridiculously sweet. Yeah. 
Asian countries have a lot of sweet, you know, they've got like condensed milk in their teas and mm. all that kind of stuff. So, but I think it's a good challenge to see if you can put yourself in, in, you know, maybe we could start reducing sugar for a moment in time. And then after say a couple of weeks when our taste buds start to adapt, have that candy bar again and you actually notice it's a lot sweeter Mm. and the same goes for example if you are not eating much sugar and then all of a sudden you have a soft drink and it's super super sweet Mm. it's not necessarily the soft drink is sweet but your ability to take that sweetness because you don't even have that much sweetness in your diet is actually really really high it's like um i think there was a guy you probably know better than me who, who created like the sugar scale and he found like the perfect spot yep. of the imp- like not too much sugar so it's not too sweet not too little yeah you know goldilocks just right yeah. and i'm pretty sure since he's created it, it's gone, it's up. gone up yeah yeah, yeah. and food <laughs> it's crazy how much i guess food and marketing and the products are out there is all science like McDonald's has, or you know, KFC, or all these like franchises have actually a lot of food scientists working for them who are actually figuring out what is the best ratio of fat to sugar mm. to make it addictive. And that's scary because they know how to, I guess, deter us from certain products and, and increase our desire yeah, for wow. certain products. So it's no surprise that we're addicted to sugar because it's literally science. And yeah, there's people with full-time jobs trying to get you addicted. Yeah. And then this is what our generation has to compete with. You've got, yeah. you've got people who are trying to get you addicted to sugar. The same people who are at Facebook and Instagram uh, trying to uh, analyzing how they can make you stay on the platform, mm-hmm. make it as addictive as possible. Mm-hmm. It's like we're just being rammed with everything so that we have these addicted natures. Same with drugs yep. and stuff. It's like, it's just, and in, you know, when you're 16, 17, 18, or like going through HSC is a perfect storm of, you know, you don't have any money, you know, you've just turned 18, so you're going to mm-hmm. start drinking mm-hmm. and probably spending a lot more of the little money you have. Mm-hmm. You can suddenly go and get McDonald's. You can drive. Like, the amount of Macca's runs I did when I got my license yeah. was ridiculous. Like, even I did it. Yeah. Because <laughs> it was cool. Yeah, it's fun. It was yeah. a good reason to hang out. Yeah. But then you just go get a frozen Coke yeah. or you go get a quarter pounder meal, like, yeah. all the time. Yeah. Stuff like that. And then you've got so much stress on you. You're probably mm-hmm. not st- sleeping much. Mm-hmm. It's like, you need to be really mm-hmm. careful. Mm-hmm. And a lot of this can contribute to why we have such high levels of mental health in young yeah. people. You need to get your nutrition sorted when you're younger, yeah. especially when you're like 18, going yeah. in that phase. Yeah. yeah, I definitely agree with that. Um, I remember even when I was 17 and I got my license, um, my peas, and the, it, I didn't even want a McFlurry, but I just wanted to go to McDonald's yeah, to get a McFlurry. Yeah, so me. <laughs> and then like I'd go, I'd sleep really poorly and then go out on the weekends and drink. And yeah, that's okay for, you know, a bit of time. But if that becomes the norm, that's not okay. Mm. And I think the, probably the biggest advice I would give in that sense is like make it cool to be healthy. Like mm. honestly make it cool. Like go out for coffee and brunch and a walk with your friends. Like instead of going out that, that Saturday night, um, you know, instead of going to McDonald's and going through drive through maybe be go on a weekend getaway with your friends all that kind of stuff is yeah. is soul filling rather than kind of the cool thing to do yeah or do a na- like do the national park drive and yeah. pack some snacks or something yeah like yeah. it's yeah that's a, it's a great point because mm. i feel like i did i was in a few different friend groups and some friend groups it was cool to be healthier mm. and there was that environment where mm. it was just like um you know we'll, we'll get brunch or we'll do mm. this and other friend groups it was like drink as much alcohol as you can in, the, yeah. in that night and we'll they'll message at two o'clock in the in the morning from yeah. McDonald's run or something. Yeah. And it's just like, you've already got so many other factors hitting you, studying, you got the always pressure of choosing what you want to do. It's like, it's just going to, everything combines. So there's one, you know, mess mm-hmm. of mental mm-hmm. health problems mm-hmm. that we're seeing. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And so, yeah, I think that's a really good point mm. is make it cool. Yeah. And how do we make it cool? Like, how do we make it cool? I guess the examples you gave were... Yeah, you know, so like brunch. have an option, like another option. So instead of going out on a Saturday night, every Saturday night, maybe instead having a movie night in with your friends and having popcorn or making a nice dinner together. Yeah. That is so fun. Like yeah, that, is that is honestly fun. fun. I want to do it right now. Um, a Sunday morning, go out for a coffee or a walk with your friend. Mm. Um, after school, instead of going to McDonald's, maybe having a study session or something like that or going to the dog's home. Or There's so many different things you can do that aren't revolved around you know, getting takeaway mm. and all that stuff. But I think because it's so ingrained in us and so normalized, I think that's when it's kind of, that's worrying. Um, but normalize being healthy. Like, why don't we just normalize yeah. being healthy? Because that's what's going to get us through in the long run. Yeah. And they say, you know, you are the, fo- you are the five people you hang around yeah. with. Yeah. So if you're hanging around your friend groups, all being healthy and mm-hmm. all doing this stuff, that's likely you're going to lose weight or put on muscle yeah. or have a better nutrition, have a better diet because you're surrounded by those. Yeah. 
those close people. And uh, one thing I forgot to add is like go to the gym together. Yeah. Like, go to F45 together or, you know, CrossFit or whatever it may be. Like that's so much fun. Yeah. And you guys can both be you know, strong together and see yourself lifting more weights mm. or running further, join sports teams, all that kind of stuff. Because you can't go out on a Saturday night if you have a rowing training on Sunday at 5 a.m. Yeah. Well, it's, it's a great point. Yeah. Um, because like I fundamentally fundamentally do not believe in cardio as a concept for humans like yeah. the fact you go to a gym and just run like for me <laughs> cardio should always be something social like yeah. sport or going yeah. like if, if you want to run run in a group together join mm-hmm. a running group mm-hmm. like you know tennis soccer whatever it is i feel like cardio shouldn't even exist in terms of just doing cardio for the sake of cardio you yeah. should be doing it as a social activity yeah um, yeah so exactly what you mentioned yeah. like make it cool yeah and you yeah. can like, actually have a lot of fun with it exactly and i also think it's important for schools to make sure that there is um that is facilitated so making sure that the kids have enough support to do school like sports and everything like that or Mm. to go to the gym or make it normal to eat a good lunch or have healthy canteen options Mm. all that kind of stuff I think is really important for schools to do and I think from when I was at school to now it's definitely improved in some schools I don't know about others but my school specifically I think is improved but um, you know I remember when I was actually in my nutrition degree one of the things I did was go to a school and they had like a kitchen garden and I think that's really great because the kids you know they learnt what vegetables were and they learnt how to cook it and it excites them Mm. so you know from an early age up until when you're in high school and things like that I think it's really important for schools to facilitate healthy living well the problem is with my school public school the canteen is independent meaning they pay rent which means they want to make as much money as possible and they're not going to make money off carrot bags they're going to make money off steak pies Mm. and chips mm. and soft drinks mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and so i guess maybe if the private school if they the canteens are part of the private school they yeah. have that control that's true but with public schools when it's independent because mm. like for me the canteen's just gotten worse and it's gotten more expensive which mm. actually was another point i wanted to bring up one of yeah. the biggest problems i think we face with nutrition <laughs> is fast food is cheaper than good yeah. f- healthy food yeah. and like all the f- bad food is easier and more accessible like the only times I ever eat McDonald's or fast food is because of the convenience. Yeah. Like I'm, I've only got half an hour to, I've got to get home. I'll pick up something on the drive through on the yeah. way. Yeah. I never actually go out to it. Yeah. It's just a pure convenience. Yeah. Good point. What I will say is fast food actually from in terms of money is actually more expensive than good food. But it depends on what good food you mean. Yeah, mm. the superfoods, they're expensive and totally pointless anyway but if you're making say for example like a chili con carne with good lean meat yeah. and beans and tomato paste and you have that for four days in a row that's going to be a lot cheaper mm. than having mcdonald's for four days in a row it's more like sumo salad is 15 dollars for a salad yes. and mcdonald's is 10 dollars for a burger yes yeah so like takeaway foods i yes. guess yes. yeah and i agree with that i think I mean, for somebody who, like, uh, as a dietitian, I'm not perfect, and there's some days where I don't prep food and things like that. Mm. I think there are a lot of healthy convenience mo- meals coming out. So even at Coles and Woolies, I know, or like the supermarkets that you've got, um, I know that they actually have some really good healthy convenience meals. Mm. So salads, and then buying one of those packet salads for say five bucks and yeah. a, a can of tuna. That's super easy. That's what I do. Super convenient. Well, I have so. Here's a little hack for anyone listening yes. if they want to. So I get like the Uncle Ben's rice, yes. which is like 90 seconds, yeah. three bucks or two dollars or something. Yeah. And you heat that up, put that in a bowl with tuna, which yeah. I buy on sale for like a dollar a can. Yeah. And then I have like a thing of um, the little legume things. I forget what they're called. Um, is that, are they like chickpeas or beans? Yeah, chickpeas. Yeah. yeah. Oh, they're chickpeas. so good. And then they I just chickpeas. buy a little bag of veggies and yep. eat that up and that's yeah. like put it in a bowl and it's so like easy. six or seven dollars for a meal so easy which adds up if you're doing you know 10 15 dollars every day eating out yep. you know six bucks is only 30 yep. bucks a week yeah and that's your lunch and you could do that in a cheaper way for example cool. having um dried chickpeas uh, if you want to prep it for example like dried rice you dried could pe- like that could rice. be half of price yeah, if you yeah. really wanted to and i'm exactly the same like if i have a busy day my meals is literally microwave potatoes tuna um, like the salad mix or cabbage mix mm. with beetroot, canned beetroot, canned corn. Yeah. And that's literally my meals like five times out of seven on, yeah. on, a, on a weekday. And like, yeah, okay, probably not the healthiest to have every single day because I'm not getting all the nutrients, but it's healthier than like Macca's or going out and getting takeaway. And it's it's healthier than bas- basically any going out food. That's right. Yeah, yeah. But I think convenience-wise, there is a lot 
of what way this to go, but I think it's possible to eat healthy and be busy and mm. not be necessarily the most wealthy person in the world. Um, there is, and I think you know things like Hello Fresh and and um, Goodness Me. No, not was it? Um, what's the other brand? Dynam? Uh, not Dynamic. Um, oh, yeah, Doordat. No. I know, I know Marley and Spoon about. or whatever. There's a few. Yeah, there's a few. Um, they're actually really good. Like they're. I do Hello Fresh. Yeah, my, yeah. My family will alternate each yeah. each night. Yeah, and they're delicious and they're fresh and they're convenient. All that kind of stuff. Like, yeah, okay, that's probably more expensive than buying it separately. But is that more expensive than buying takeaway every night? Yeah, probably not. It is more expensive, but it's not that bad. Yeah. Like if you yes, if you went to the shops and yeah. bought everything, you're going to be cheaper. Yeah. But it was also great because I don't know I suck at cooking. Yeah. So having those instructions laid exactly. out, exactly. It's like it's very easy for me to learn to cook. Yeah. And then once I've done a whole bunch of meals, I can start. Then I could go just buy those at exactly. the shops if I wanted to. Yeah. So yeah. building those habits, yeah. which, as you mentioned, habits, because mm-hmm. cooking is a very valuable skill. Yes. Especially if you're like eighteen or nineteen and you're going to move out soon, mm-hmm. you're going to have no money. You're going to be living off yeah. what we're living off right now, like tuna and rice and stuff, <laughs> which is great. So fun. I love it. Yeah, I love tuna, um, and I think is well yeah okay like it might be more extended to eat healthy sometimes but like it's your health like mm. it matters if you don't have your health like your health is literally your wealth yeah if you don't have your health you have nothing yeah so buy that extra veggie like buy that extra fruit mm. because it's your health like mm. that's what matters so it doesn't matter if it's a bit more expensive because you need to prioritize that yeah well, i mentioned earlier like health finance and relationships yeah. are probably like three core essential things that you need to have sorted in your life yeah and you know if you've got all three of those things you'll be probably you'll probably be successful it's a very what does successful mean but i would consider that quite successful mm. you've got good solid relationships you've got good finance beha- behaviors and then you've got good health yeah but like that's kind of the three core things yeah. i guess most people are trying to achieve yeah but most people fail like yeah what is, what's the obesity rate in america and australia oh, it's, it's like 60 upwards of 60 percent in adults terrifying and yeah yeah it's yeah, it's yeah, yeah. makes me want to cry. Yeah, yeah. And this is because they don't have the habits when they're kids. They were like our age, yeah. or younger people. And then, it, you know, they have a kid and mm-hmm. then they're working long hours mm-hmm. and it's they're not maintaining it mm-hmm. and they just, you know, haven't prioritized it. Mm-hmm. And now yeah. they're obese. Yeah, yeah, definitely, definitely. Mm. Um, yeah, I think it's very, very, very scary. But there is something you can do about it as well. Yeah. Like, and I think, yeah, you might not be able to afford a dietitian and everything like that, but... Even if it's just one appointment with a nutrition professional or, or someone, I think that is still good to do. Like yeah. one appointment and for that nutrition professional to be like, all right, let's increase your veggies, do this, you're not having enough calcium. That could be really important. That one conversation, you're not having enough calcium, could make you, you know, 30 years down the track say, thank God I spent that 100 bucks on a nutrition appointment because yeah, now yeah. I don't have osteoporosis. Yeah, yeah. Like, that's important. Yeah, yeah. And even if you can't do that, like, you can just start researching. Yeah. Or just becoming self-aware. Yeah. And so by yeah. listening to the episode, if they become self-aware, they can, like, go on YouTube, start looking at what other people are saying. Yeah. But don't blindly listen to anyone unless they're yeah. qualified and they're actually talking to you specifically. Correct, yeah. Um, as we mentioned before, the influencers. Yeah, yeah. But, um, yeah, anyway, it's been a great conversation. Before yeah. we wrap up, I ask all my guests the final question. It can be completely unrelated to anything we've spoken about. But what would your number one piece of advice be for the younger generation? Gen Z, you know, 16, 17, 18, coming out of high school, entering uni, that sort of that sort of age. It's a really good question, Byron. And I'm thinking about my younger self and I think it would literally just be believe in yourself. Mm. Honestly, believe in yourself and don't compare yourself to anybody else's journey. You know what's best for you. And if you don't, like that is okay as well. But just follow your gut believe in yourself and everything will work out and if it doesn't it means it's not the end yeah um and yeah just just go with your gut and follow your instincts yeah especially with like nutrition and diet and stuff like one of the things we was po- talking about in another podcast was like when you're at the gym the only person you're comparing yourself to is yourself yeah two weeks ago or something yeah. have i improved from where i was a week ago yeah you're not comparing yourself to old mate who's ripped or yep. the girl who's squatting the mm-hmm. x amount or whatever mm-hmm. you're just comparing it and it's the same with nutrition yep. i think you keep comparing yep. yourself to your past self yep. and are you improving in whatever yep. it is don't compare yourself to your friends because mm-hmm. they have different metabolisms different speeds like different body types yep. so it's really actually toxic to compare yes. yourself to someone who might be yep. have a way faster metabolism yep. which is most inf- instagram influencers let's be real mm-hmm. most of them have quite a fast metabolism and even though they might be really healthy and stuff yeah. they, they're kind of born lucky as well 
but it's also and, I, and you made a good point like a lot of them do but it's also you don't know what goes behind the scenes as well mm. like you have no idea if they actually eat what they show that they yeah, eat yeah. They, you don't know if they're going for three extra gym sessions and it's scary but unfortunately that is happening and I just think it's important just to not even judge an Instagram person because you don't even know. They might be showing what they eat in a day, but you don't know if that's actually what they eat in a day. Yeah, and do they do that every day or do they just do it because the cameras were on? Correct, yeah. Mm. So be cautious with that. Awesome. <laughs> well, for anyone interested to find out more or maybe you know look into nutrition and stuff, yeah, yeah. where can I find you or find out a bit more about what you guys do? Yeah, perfect. So I am on Instagram, just my name, Alice Bleathman underscore dietitian. I also work for Gut Started, which is like an up and coming um, business we've got going on, which is super, super exciting. It's like a nutrition done differently kind of business. Mm. Um, we're massive advocates of mental health and young people and ensuring that the foundations are there. Non-traditional sense dietitians, I guess you could say. Um, so we're on Instagram at Gut Started. And then we also have a website, www.gut-started.com. Yeah, and I'll put all the links in the yes. description below. But Amazing. Anyway, Alice, thank you so much for coming on the show. No worries. Thanks so much, Byron, for having me. That's it for this episode of the Driven Young Podcast. Thank you so much for listening to the entire episode. That means the world to me. And if you got some value out of it, please shoot me a message on Instagram or reach out to me. Or I would love for you to leave a rating or review on this podcast. So make sure you are subscribed, and I look forward to seeing you on the next episode.